So uh, thank you for coming to the uh, Glenn Lord Symposium. Uh, this is an academic uh, symposium, uh, in interdisciplinary, and uh, we have three invited guests that um, I'd like to, uh, to introduce. Uh, first up, uh, my, my name is uh, Jason Ray Carney. I am a uh, senior lecturer in popular literature at Christopher Newport University in, in Newport News, and um, I'll just be, be moderating this. I've asked the uh, presenters to um, keep their presentations to 10 to 15 minutes to leave uh, 15 minutes for Q&A um, afterwards. Um, I'm going to be leaning on you for the questions, so um, the 15 minutes will be set aside for, for your uh, re responses and questions. So uh, I'm just going to introduce all three now, and then um, we'll have a, let me see, Gabriel will go first, followed by uh, James, followed by um, Dirk. So one second, I have some introductions. So uh, Dr. Gabriel Mamola is, uh, is, did I say that correctly? Yes. Uh, Mamola is a writer, independent scholar, and soon-to-be homeschooling dad. He received his MA in English uh, from the University of Dallas and his PhD uh, from the University of Texas at Arlington. Uh, his scholarly interests include speculative fiction, modernism, pulp, classical rhetoric, and the English novel. Dr. Mamola's scholarship has appeared in several academic journals, uh, Foundation, Extrapolation, Myth Lore, and Science Fiction Studies. And then uh, we have uh, Dr. Dirk uh, Gunther, is um, a professor of English literature at uh, Gakushin uh, Women's College in Tokyo, Japan. I feel very um, proud that I, I said that clearly. Uh, where he is a member of the Faculty of Intercultural Studies um, and uh, English Communication. He earned his PhD at uh, Hiroshima University. Uh, his doctoral thesis is titled uh, History and Robert E. Howard's Fantastic Stories from an Age Undreamed of to the Era of the Old West and Texas Frontier. Um, Dr. Gunther has uh, received several awards for his scholarship, uh, not least being uh, the Robert E. Howard Foundation's um, Venerian Emerging Scholar Award and the Crom Special Achievement Award. And then finally, uh, Dr. Uh, James McLaughlin is an Associate Professor of Philosophy and Theology, um, Beth Bethlehem College and Seminary in Minneapolis, Minnesota. Uh, he earned his PhD from the Ohio State University in Columbus, yeah. Ohio. You, you don't want to forget that, uh, that article. Go Bucks. Uh, I'm from Columbus. So. Uh, his research uh, interests include philosophy of logic, philosophical theology, and the ethics and aesthetics of Jonathan Edwards. Uh, Dr. McLaughlin is currently researching monsters and horror in relation to uh, theology. All right, so um, please, Dr. Mamola, uh, take it away. Okay. Um, is this on? Yeah. Okay. Uh, so what I'd like to talk about today are Robert Howard's and H.P. Lovecraft's letters and I'm going to frame my presentation as a not-so-subtle pitch for reading and enjoying them and reading them as kind of telling a story. Uh, so in light of that, what I'm going to offer in this presentation are some pertin pertinent facts and contacts, contexts and background information that should hopefully uh, cast some light on the denser uh, more esoteric and uh, sometimes pointless seeming passages of their correspondence, particularly that infamously long and drawn out and sometimes quite uh, tedious and bitchy argument between the two writers on the, uh, on the merits of a state of civilization versus a state of barbarism. Lovecraft famously waxes philosophically about civilization's merits, while Howard naturally careens between cynical dismissal of the civilized and a kind of earthy poetic praise of the simple and barbaric. But Howard's and Lovecraft's argument is a discussion I'm going to propose today that has much more simmering under the surface than the mere philosophically abstract debate between two self-taught non-philosophers about the best way to live that it appears to be. And my goal is to key you in a little bit to some of that hidden zest and interest and the kind of narrative arc that is hiding uh, in those letters. Now, this isn't to say that I don't think Howard's and Lovecraft's letters don't stand on their own, only that there are some things about their discussion uh, that can be discussions that can be easy to miss and that I think add a lot to what makes those letters interesting and fun to read. Uh, what are those things? Glad you asked. Let's begin. Uh, to step away from the letters for a moment, if we look at Lovecraft's 
uh, in memoriam, the tribute Lovecraft wrote for the friend and fellow weird author he never met, we find some interesting statements from Lovecraft about how he viewed Howard's art as well as how he viewed literature in general. While HP acknowledges the unique achievement that is the creation of the Hyborian Age and the power of Howard's fantasy and horror stories, the thing that really impresses Lovecraft is the way in which Howard embodies his region, his Texan cross plains origins. Lovecraft says of Howard in the tribute, his real gifts were even higher than the readers of his published work could suspect, and had he lived would have helped him make his mark in serious literature with some folk epic of his beloved Southwest. Now, this might seem like faint praise or even a denigration of Howard's abilities. It isn't, but I'll have to circle back around to why I think so. But it also isn't just a throwaway line in an obituary, and instead, marks something that really impressed Lovecraft about Howard. He says earlier in the tribute, other powerful fantasies lay outside the connected series, these including the memorable serial Skullface and a few distinctive tales with a modern setting such as the recent Black Canaan with its genuine regional background and its clutchingly compelling picture of the horror that stalks through the moss-hung, shadow-cursed, serpent-ridden swamps of the American far south. And then later, Lovecraft notes Howard's increasingly frequent tales of Western life, such as the Breckenridge Elkins series, shooed, Lovecraft, his growing ability and inclination to reflect on the backgrounds with which he was directly familiar. Region, background, folk epic, serious literature, Southwestern life. What is going on here? What is Lovecraft talking about? We 21st century readers are left asking, why doesn't old Howard Phillips recognize that it is precisely in exploding beyond any kind of serious literature that Two-Gun Bob achieved his immortality? Is it just that Lovecraft liked Howard's westerns better than his tales in an age undreamed? Not quite. And this is where we'll turn, not to the letters just yet, but to what was, for a long time, a serious question in American literature that has now been more or less forgotten. And that is the place and importance of regional fiction, fiction grounded and rooted in place. There occurred, throughout the 19th century and into the 20th, a struggle between writers, between critics, between academics, between audiences, to hash out the role of place locality, fiction of specific regions of American literature. And it's centered on the question of to what degree America's national literature should represent a kind of universalized aesthetic synthesis of American vision versus to what degree it should ignore such centralizing concerns in favor of a kind of patchwork quilt of local color and radical diverse authenticity. You will note that analogs to this struggle continue today in American culture. It is inherent to our political and cultural organization. E pluribus unum, on the one hand, diversity which celebrates difference and authenticity, and on the other hand, nationalistic inclusion which celebrates unity and a kind of abstract, formalized, balanced harmony. Diversity and inclusion, stripped of the particular political weight we give them today, reveal themselves to be the two unreconcilable poles and goals of American life and culture. Every truly American political and cultural movement is the doomed attempt to have both authentic diversity and inclusive unity at the same time. Or more charitably, such movements take shape as the different ways of navigating these competing, contrary ideals. Today, we typically think about the opposition of diversity and inclusion in identitarian terms. In Howard's and Lovecraft's time, this struggle was played out literarily in terms of regionalism, or literature tied to or emerging from specific regions of America, versus something you could call an aesthetic cosmopolitanism, or universalism, or even cosmicism in a certain way. I'll give you two American immortals 
each more or less talking about the same experience, that of floating across a river, as examples. Walt Whitman is our most perfect genius of the all-inclusive cosmopolitan American aesthetic. Uh, it avails not. Time nor place, distance avails not. I am with you, you men and women of a generation, or ever so many generations hence. Just as you feel when you look on the river and sky, so I felt. Just as any of you is one of a living crowd, I was one of a crowd. Just as you stand and lean on the rail, yet hurry with the swift current, I stood, yet, yet was hurried. And that's Whitman. Our most famous regionalist is almost certainly Mark Twain. We said there weren't no home like a raft, after all. Other places do seem so cramped up and smothery, but a raft don't. You feel mighty, free, and easy and comfortable on a raft. And one quick key thing to note here is that regionalism didn't mean literature that was any less accessible or beloved. Twain was, after all, an international celebrity. It was instead understood to be a realistic literature that portrayed real people and real places as they really were, warts and dialects and all. The debate, if you can call nearly a hundred years of literary experimentation and development a debate, was about which of these strains represents or ought to represent America's self-consciously national literature, our literary identity. Is American literature a tapestry or a patchwork quilt? Howard's and Lovecraft's writings came at what more or less amounts to the end of that great American literary project. And writers like Faulkner, O'Connor, Steinbeck, Baldwin, and so on and so on, uh, and really with America's embrace of modernism, and especially as Hollywood took over more and more of our cultural real estate, we achieved a kind of equilibrium between cosmic inclusiveness and localized diversity that lasted for some time. Nonetheless, if we examine Howard's and Lovecraft's letters with this literary background in mind, their long and bitter debate about civilization and barbarism uh, becomes more of an oblique attempt by two artists to understand the place of their art in the American literary tradition's inescapable uh, regionalism. Alongside the tradition of pure literature, if you will, going back to the classical Greek and Romans. Now you might be guessing that I'm about to say that Lovecraft's letters and his stance in the civilization versus barbarism debate show him to be the cosmopolitan to Howard's regionalist. But that's not quite right. Uh, although my thesis is that the civilization versus barbarism debate is really a regionalism, regionalism versus cosmopolitanism debate in disguise, if you look at what and how each of these idiosyncratic geniuses argues and look at their works themselves, you will find Lovecraft much more fully dedicated to embodying his cultural place at the same time that he develops his cosmic horror. After all, where does the great dream quest of unknown Kadath end? Uh, with a vision of the red gabled rooftops of Providence. Howard, on the other hand, in his Hyborian age, presents a game-changing, you could almost say temporal cosmopolitanism. Uh, where every civilization worth adventuring in is immediately accessible to his barbarian hero. I said earlier that Lovecraft wasn't damning Howard with faint praise when he said his talents were better than, say, his Hyborian fantasies might show, as strange as that seems to us uh, through the filter of you know, Howard's legacy and time. Uh, he just genuinely admired Lovecraft. He genuinely admired regional fiction felt it was where the true vein of American literary art pulsed, and believed Howard had the talent and experience to take his place alongside Mark Twain uh, or Sherwood Anderson or even uh, the Weird Tales alum August Derleth, a recognized figure in the regionalist canon. I don't have the time to go through and demonstrate all this here as pedantically as I would like, being as I am a literal pedant. So we'll have to make do with a few choice quotes to gesture towards what I mean. Says Lovecraft, I can feel no interest in the heterogeneous, traditionless, industrial, and mechanical empire which this nation threatens to become. Such a thing would not have enough coherence, continuity, 
memory appeal or identification with the historic stream to give me any satisfying sense of placement, interest, meaning, or direction. And then addressing Howard directly, he, Lovecraft later says, a pile of your letters is a choice slice of literature, and one can imagine what you could do if you really sat down to mirror inclusively and systematically the heroic march of events across the soil of your native region. I certainly hope you will attempt such a magnum opus today, uh, someday, and believe it would have a great chance at success. And finally, more to the issue of the civiliz civilization versus barbarism debate, in spite of the residual delight which you still take in primitive things, a large part of whose attractiveness to you, by the way, is purely the result of your highly civilized dramatic imagination, hence would not exist if you had the things without the perspective giving civilization, it remains a fact that your natural imaginative processes are of a powerful, delicate, and highly evolved kind, which could never find satisfaction in the primitive world you idealize. Uh, it is thus Lovecraft's explicit goal of turning Howard towards regional literature and Howard's varied uh, and very justified reactions and responses to Lovecraft's exhortations uh, that stand as the dramatic backdrop to their argument about civilization and to the letters as a whole. And while we, in hindsight, naturally and justly dismiss any idea, I, excuse me, uh, naturally and justly dismiss any idea that Howard spent too much time writing about barbarians, we can perceive, I think, Lovecraft's insight into his friend, uh, aside from his kind of failure to, to see the, the genius and value of the Hyborian age stories and the fantasies. Um, because Lovecraft sees very well the way in which Howard's escapist leap into the Hyborian age, while truly an unmatched triumph of American literature, does point towards the darker uh, and more tragic aspects of Howard's personality, as great art is wont to do. Lovecraft, on the other hand, finds Howard himself and the very Texan world and region and history Howard embodied to be the true genius in the older senses of that word as a spirit of place. Thank you. So in 1974, a little fanzine came out from Amra with an article entitled, Conan the Existentialist, written by a very young Charles Hoffman. I've heard it commented by more than one person in this room that this article almost single-handedly started serious Conan criticism and scholarship. I ran across the article almost, uh, just a few years ago, and I remember sort of rolling my eyes. Uh, being an academic philosopher, existentialism nowadays is not really seeing so much more than a phase that college students go through, usually after taking their first philosophy course. But upon reading Hoffman's article, I found it an insightful essay that indeed correctly showed the parallels that existed between existentialist philosophy, the kind of philosophy that was uh, sort of reign, uh, reigning uh, in Europe and America in the 1950s, 1960s. Um, some of the key figures here are uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, Simone de Beauvoir, and Albert Camus. Uh, uh, Hoffman correctly saw uh, parallels that existed. So I just want to do briefly here today, I just want to briefly revisit Hoffman's essay. Um, I want, but I, overall, I, what I want, I want to do is strengthen Hoffman's original thesis. Okay? I think he's actually, more, uh, Howard's Cohen is actually more existentialist than he realized or he took the time to build. I'm going to do that by comparing it to a famous uh, existentialist essay. And then I want to make a, a couple comments at the end based upon this. So going back to Hoffman's original essay, what exactly was existentialist philosophy and how is it parallel with Howard's Conan stories? When his original e essay, Hoffman correctly noted that existentialist philosophy could be summarized with this very terse slogan, existence precedes essence. Now the word essence here is a technical term. It's historically the term that philosophers use to argue that there is a property or a collection of properties that anything has, that if you took it away from that object, you'd either destroy the thing, or that thing would cease to be fulfilling the purpose for what it was supposed to do. So a couple examples will help here. So kind of tried and true examples to give this. The essence of a ball is roundness. 
There's all kinds of different balls. You can make balls out of different materials, different colors. But if you take away its roundness, you've taken away it being a ball. Another typical example is the essence of a knife is the ability to cut things. If a knife fails to cut things, then it's no longer considered a knife or not much of a knife. So the primary thing to note here is that for an essence in this traditional philosophical concept, concept an essence is what determines the existence of something. But existentialists claim that that traditional understanding was backwards, at least for human beings. As Hoffman noted, existentialists believe, quote, man has no purpose. He is free to determine his own essential nature, end quote. So Hoffman then goes on to make the case that the existentialist credo is a good description of Howard's portrayal of Conan. Hoffman summarizes that we can see in the Conan stories that he, quotes, creates and carries out his own destiny, and, quote, he is the consummate self-determining man, end quote. So thus Conan, at least in the Howard Conan uh, canon, is portrayed as having no transcendent purpose or predetermined essence. He simply determines his own life as existentialism so claims. Now Hoffman goes on to list several parallels between other, par other parallels between existentialism and Conan, but I want to strengthen Hoffman's argument by comparing it to a famous and powerful work of the French ex existentialist philosopher Albert Camus. In 1942, Camus published an essay uh, that brought some highly original reflections to the ancient Greek myth of Sisyphus. The original myth relates that Sisyphus, due to his disobedience against the gods, was punished by them to eternally push a large rock up a hill that would repeatedly roll back down the hill. And eternally, Sisyphus was forced to repeat this task over and over with no hope of it ever ending or ever accomplishing anything. That's just the original Greek myth. Camus saw this myth as a fitting metaphor for modern people since he believed that it represented the seemingly purposelessness and futility of modern life. Camus held that many modern people saw their life as wearisome drudgery with no hope or meaning. So in short, Camus claimed that the myth of Sisyphus captured the essence of the absurdity of human life as he understood it. But in addition, Camus goes on to assert the following, which I think is a pretty radical claim. He says Sisyphus should be viewed as, quote, the true hero of the absurd, end quote. So Camus seems to think of Sisyphus as a hero for th at least three reasons, and I think all of these parallel with Conan as well. So first, Camus implies that Sisyphus' heroism at least pa uh, lies partly in his sheer physical courage, every day, day after day, pushing up this large boulder. And obviously, with Conan, a large part of his hero status is due to his great strength and physical acumen that he displays as well. As Hoffman highlighted, quote, the outstanding quality of Conan is his sheer force, end quote. And we can see this all over the Howard stories of Conan. Secondly, Camus seems to think of Sisyphus as a hero simply because of his, his courageous disobedience against controlling forces. Sisyphus is punished by the gods because he defied their rules. Conan is also often portrayed as butting heads with those who attempt to control him. Indeed, this perspective is often reflected in the famous theme of barbarism versus civilization. But to just focus on one facet of that, it's clear that Howard often portrayed sorcerers or wizards negatively in his Conan stories. So Dennis Rickard noted, noted the following, quote, It's not surprising that Howard used sorcerers extensively. His fiction centered around conflict and power, and the supernormal, supernormal powers wielded by his magicians allowed for a type of conflict that served as a counterpoint to straightforward warfare and swordplay. Power is, in fact, what ties all the different types of sorcery together. They, they, they have control over people, over demons, the elements, and seemingly over death itself, as in the case of the novel The Hour of the Dragon." End quote. So magic is clearly powerful and fearful in Conan stories, but Conan is all the more heroic, like Sisyphus, in that he tries to defy such power through his brute strength and his wits. But there's a third reason, and I think it's the primary reason for why Camus views Sisyphus as a hero, it, and which also fits with Conan. Camus imagined Sisyphus, this is uh, Camus adding his own sort of, uh, uh, sort of interpretation to the myth, he liked to imagine Sisyphus' continual return down the hill to repeat this task of pushing the rock up eternally as a conscious defiance of his fate. And this is where Camus' rhetoric really soars. I'm going to quote Camus. He says, quote, It's during that return, that pause, that Sisyphus interests me. A face that toils so close to stone is already stone itself. 
I see that man going back down with a heavy yet measured step towards the torment of which he will never know the end. That hour, like a breathing space, which returns as surely as his suffering, that is the hour of consciousness. At each of those moments when he leaves the heights and gradually sinks back down towards the hill, he is superior to his fate, he is stronger than his rock, end quote. So Camus portrays Sisyphus as heroic here simply due to his conscious defiance of his fate, even though it's inescapable. Camus saw Sisyphus as triumphant in his attitude regardless of his circumstances. And I think this is true of Conan as well, though Conan seems to always triumph in spite of the odds. Think of the vulture biting scene in A Witch Shall Be Born, or his attempt to capture the frost giant's daughter in the middle of an arctic waste. Regardless of the apparent hopelessness of the situation, Conan, like Sisyphus, always fights on. So I think this comparison with Camus' analysis of Sisyphus strengthens Hoffman's original claim. Existentialist philosophy is indeed present within Howard's Conan. I think this is especially insightful given that this essay is written several years after uh, Howard's death. So Howard's on to a sort of um, uh, a gestalt or a sort of world spirit that's not even reached re re the philosophical scene quite yet. Um, Um, so the last thing I want to add here is that this also explains one of the things that attracts us to the character of Conan, the fact that he displays virtue despite this existentialist framework. Now there's obviously some difference between Sisyphus and Conan. Primarily, the inescapable fate of Sisyphus seems more, like a com seems more comparable to a character in a Clark Ashton Smith or H.P. Lovecraft horror story. And Robert him Howard himself even noted as much in a letter to Lovecraft. He wrote the following, quote, Howard, I lack your universal and cosmic scope and comprehension. It is the individual mainly which draws me, the struggling, blundering, passionate insect, vainly striving against the river of life and seeking to divert the channel of events to suit himself, breaking his fangs on the iron collar of fate and seeking into final defeat with the froth of a curse on his lips." End quote. Note Howard's characterization of the individual. It is one who is struggling, one vainly striving, which sounds very much like Sisyphus, though Howard wrote his letter over a decade before Camus penned his famous essay. But there's still a clear difference. As Brian Murphy noted in his recent book on uh, History on Sword and Sorcery, he says, quote, unlike the horrible end suffered by the protagonists of Smith and Lovecraft, Howard's hero heroes valiantly fought back and mostly win, or at least live to fight another day. But Murphy goes on to emphasize, quote, they will ultimately lose, though. Lost in time beneath floods or sweeping barbaric hordes, or robbed of vitality by age and infirmity. End quote. So Conan is not a timeless warrior who will eternally win and fight and win. He is mortal, and regardless of the number of victories he claims, death will one day end up being the ultimate victor over Conan. But regardless, Conan fights on. Like Sisyphus, he continually returns to the battle, continually returns to the task at hand. Again, Murphy comments, quote, Howard's heroes, he's talking about more than just Conan, Howard's heroes raged against the dying of the light, drinking and feasting and reveling in the pleasures of the flesh while they still had the strength of the sword, their sword arms. And this is what makes Conan, as well as other Howard heroes, so admirable. Courage in the face of no real meaning, no big goal, no quest that might give purpose to human life. Yet, and regardless of the outcome, Conan still pushes on. There is something admirable about the courage of seeing one, as Howard himself said, breaking his fangs on the iron collar of fate. So this display of courage is all the more admirable given the existentialist background of Howard's Conan. One of the biggest criticisms against existentialism is that it provides no grounding for ethics or morality. Since existentialism is built upon the idea that there's no essence to human beings, it seems difficult to see how morality is an objective fact of human experience. Now, existentialists argue that that's not indeed the case. They go on to argue that though human beings must indeed define their existence, the ethical life is not arbitrary or relativistic. For our purposes, I won't go into or attempt to outline their arguments. But I do believe that the existentialist framework is presented by Howard, okay, and the outlook we've recognized within the Howardian Conan stories highlights all the more the virtue displayed by Conan. Conan is clearly not bound by moral codes of civilization, nor does he seem to adhere to any sort of divine ethical commands. Yet, in the absence of the existence of any clear, objective, moral truth, Conan still exhibits recognizable virtue, which makes him all the more attractive as a hero.
Okay, first um, short request from the non-native speaking uh, German guy. Um, I'm doing something today which I would usually not do in conference or presentations. I'm reading my stuff. Uh, usually it's, I sound much better when I speak freely. So uh, what I'm saying, please bear with me and tell me after the presentation how my English sucks or teach me uh, proper pronunciation. So okay, with this having been said, um, so uh, Brian McMahon, yes, after Conan. <laughs> okay. So uh, Howard's fascination with the Picts is probably a generally known fact, and Howard's fascination led him so far that he actually created an alternative history of the Picts, in which he documented uh, their fall from probably having been a leading nation of pre times before times down to turning to ape-like, beast-like creatures. And Howard established this alternative history or introduced it in the story Man of the Shadows. And this description was pretty general about the Picts' origins, the wanderings through various ages, and the uh, various evolutionary phases, but lacked one thing, embellishments in form of heroic characters or decisive events like battles or other conflicts. And it was actually this lack of individual conflict and drama why the story was rejected by Weird Tales editor Farnsworth Wright. Now Howard, the awesome guy that he is, remedied this lack immediately by turning Brian McMahon, who was actually originally a side character in Man of the Shadows, into the protagonist of three stories. Worms of the Earth, Kings of the Night, and The Dark Man, where Brian appeared in name only. Now, by making Brian McMahon the protagonist of these stories, Howard created a character who, in my humble opinion, person personifies and mirrors exactly the drama and uh, yeah, the drama of Howard's alternative history of the Picts. So in Man of the Shadows, Bran is shown from the very first moment in a way that marks him as special. Uh, the captive Norse uh, mercenary describes Bran as a slim, dark-haired man whose head would come scarcely to my shoulder, but who seemed as lithe and strong as a leopard. He resembled in form and features the Picts no more than did I, and yet there was about him a certain apparent kinship to them." Quote end. Bran himself explains the prisoner the reason for his different appearance uh, from his own people. Quote, I am the race, I am as the race was. The line of chiefs has kept its pure blood, its blood pure through the ages, scoring the world for women of the old race. Quote end. So Brand's pure bloodedness, the result of his line not having mixed with other races, lends him a superior physique, which is drastically different from the Pict's dwarfish, beast like appearance. And this, mar this marks Bran not only as unique among the Picts. It also visually supports his claim to be the Picts' leader and king. So Bran's appearance is for the Picts, up to a certain degree, a steady reminder of their past history and the glory the Picts have lost over the run of the history. It shows them their origin condition before history changed them into, a, into their deteriorated form of beastmen. And in Man of the Shadows, Bran is the one who is actually most painfully aware of the tragedy, how the Picts have been reduced to their sad state of existence and he expresses his plight by stating, quote, look upon me, I am what the race once was. Look about you, a race of ape men. We that were the highest type of man the world could boast. So Bran is both the leader of the Picts and at the same time, due to, this, to his different and superior physique, an outsider among his people. So from both these perspectives, he clearly sees and understands the full extent of the tragedy of his people's history. He knows what the Picts themselves do not seem to realize, that they were, quote, once the highest type of man the world could boast, quote, end, and that they are now caught in a historical development that inevitably leads to further deterioration uh, of their once mighty race. Now, Bran himself, he adds a tragedy to this drama by taking on a self-chosen role. He regards it as his mission to lead and raise his people out of this condition of savagery back to their former glory. And what makes Bran's mission a real tragedy is that Bran himself knows that he will not be successful in this undertaking, as his future and his defeat are predicted by the shaman in Man of the Shadows. Uh, so just looking at the marked uh, passages, uh, Bran looks in the fire, seeing there his mighty ambitions, his dreams of empire fading into smoke. 
and even worse, in the dim mountains of Galloway shall the nation make its last fierce stand, and as Bren McMahon falls, so vanish the lost fire forever from centuries, from the eons. So Bren, uh, despite of his knowledge of the futility of his self-chosen mission and ambition, he unerringly walks the path that he knows will ultimately lead to his own demise, and this makes him truly a tragic hero. Now, in the stories, the stories Kings of the Night and Warmth of the Earth describe how Brand's character undergoes a, a process that end, at, the, at the end of which Brand loses the other aspect that sets him apart from the beast-like Picts, man, Picts, his humanity. In Kings of the Night, Brand has become the king's king of the Picts and finds himself as the leader of an unstable alliance of Picts, Celts, and Vikings that is about to give battle to Roman legions. Bran is fully aware how weak his position as, as king, uh, is as king. To his Celtic ally, he admits, how shall I lo expect loyalty from alien tribes who am not sure of my own people? Thousands lurk in the hills, holding aloof. I'm a king in name only. Let me win tomorrow, and they will flock to my standard. If I lose, they will scatter like birds before the cold wind. <laughs> so, um, despite his Pictish subjects at best unreliable loyalty, Bran still continues to fight. And although Bran regards himself as a king in name only, the events of king in Kings of the Night actually show that Bran has indeed become a king and acquired in this process all the negative attributes the position, position of a king requires. So Bran, for example, knowingly sacrifices his Viking allies, um, uh, his Viking allies. Shocked and angry about Bran's cold-bloodedness, Cormac, the leader of the Celtic troops, confronts Bran after the battle, with Bran, Bran replying in denial and even self-pity. Once again, let's have a look at uh, the red mark passages. Strike, if you will. I'm sick of slaughter. It's a cold meat is kinging it. The king must gamble with men's lives and naked swords. I sacrificed the Northmen, yes, and my heart is sore with, within me, for they were men. But had I given the order when you would have desired, all might have gone awry, or however you pronounce that one. So, last one, now my people are saved, but my heart is cold in my breast. So, um, Bran the king feels that his people do not accept him. In order to gain the Picts' acceptance, he needs to give them a victory in battle. A victory he can gain only by sacrificing allies at the cost of, of Bran's own moral values and humanity. It is out of the, his ambition, out of this ambition, that Bran gives up the Viking allies and leads them to their deaths. Brand's claim of regretting having to sacrifice his allies is hereby a rather ambiguous one. Although he claims that this sacrifice was necessary as part of his duty as a king to the well-being of his own people, it is Brand's need of satisfying his own ambition to deliver a victory that will, him that will bring him the loyalty of the Picts as his reason behind giving up his allies. The result is that Brand's victory, which should be the crowning moment of his life is, in reality, a hollow one. It leaves Bran with the realization that being a king is a burden that comes at the price of giving up one's humanity. And it is, is this very humanity that, besides his physical appearance, puts Bran above the Picts. His original motivation of his attempt to raise the Picts out of the stage of their present savagery is his wish to give the Picts back the humanity they have lost. In Kings of the Night, the tragic irony is that Bran loses his own humanity in the process of trying to restore the humanity of the Picts. Now, Bran's uh, downward spiral continues in Warmth of the Earth. After Bran witnesses how Romans crucify a Pict, he vows vengeance. And Bran does not mobilize the forces of the Picts to get his vengeance. Instead, he turns to an ally even his trusted advisor warns him to avoid the Warmth of the Earth, who are mysterious descendants of a race that lived in Britain long before the coming of the Picts. Now, in order to find these mysterious creatures, Bran has to undergo an ordeal that includes suffering, sexual humiliation, or by the witch Adler, in exchange for information how to turn the worms to his allies. So Bran's vengeance is based on his sense of duty towards the, his people, the Picts. Of the crucified Pict, Bran says, um, he was bound to my heartstrings as every man and every woman and every child of Picton is bound. It was mine to protect him now it is mine to avenge him, quote end. Brand's motivation to using against all warnings the worms of the earth as the tool of his vengeance is his yeah, misguided sense of responsibility towards his subjects 
that ignores the consequences of his uh, doings. And Bran gets the first taste that he has co called forces beyond his control when he sees the destructions the worms have wrought, wrought on the Roman fortress. His suspicion that he bargained for more than he can handle becomes finally true when he meets the target of his intended revenge, Titus Sulla, who has gone mad from the terror of his encounter with the worms. So Bran's consequent killing of the Roman is in fact not an act of taking vengeance. It is a mercy killing and can actually be understood as Bran's very last act of humanity, ironically given to the very enemy Bran had set out to punish for crucifying his Pictish subject. Bran finally realized the full extent of horror um, that uh, he woke. Like his seeming sacri regrets of sacrificing his allies in Kings of the Night, Brand's consequent lamenting of having woken such forces is, in my eyes, an act of utter hypocritical self-pity. It was Bran who ignored all the warnings and forced the worms to serve him in his vengeance. The worms had never acted out of their own volition, but only because Brand's, uh, Brand pressured them into their help. All of the destruction and havoc caused by the worms is hereby the result of Brand's doing. And it is the witch Atla who mercilessly point out points out Brand's hypo hypocrisy by asking him, um, okay, asking him, are they, the worms, more foul than the mortal, than the mortal who seeks their help? Atla adds insult to injury by taunting Bran and revealing to him the full extent and the consequences of his inv invoking the worm. Quote, King of Pickland, King of Fools, stay and let me show you the real fruits of the pits. Run, fool, run. But you are stained with the taint. You have called them forth and they will remember. And in their own time, they will come to you again, quote end. So by having invo invoked the worms, Bran has stained his honor as king and has fouled the pureness of his line. Humiliated and afraid, he runs away from the worms and Atla. Bran's leaving is not a dignified one, worthy of a king who has gained a glorious victory over a hated enemy. It is in fact Bran escaping without any dignity at all. Bran's embarrassment divulges itself in an in act in the final act of helpless violence, when he strikes Atla, resulting in her taunting him even more, more with laughter. Now, there are no sources extant, hopefully, otherwise correct me, <laughs> Rusty. <laughs> he's already, he's already, yeah. <laughs> okay. Uh, uh, there are no sources extant uh, that indicate whether Howard had in mind to create a larger Bran McMahon epic. What makes Bran so different from Cull or Conan is the fact that the reader learns, the fact the reader learns in the story, The Dark Man which can be regarded as the, the end of the Bran McMahon cycle. Bran becoming a god after his own death, after his death, in honor Howard's mightiest barbarians, Cull, Cohn, never received. So Bran's death and becoming a god makes him a very distinctly different character in Howard's catalog. And coming to an end, in conclusion, uh, with the Bran McMahon stories, Howard depicted the Pictish history and its decline at the person of Bran McMahon. Bran McMahon is the only remaining pure-blooded Pict who has kept his, his the superior, superior physiognom physiognomy uh, the Picts have lost in the course of their ancient history. On the other hand, Bran follows the Pict's tragedy by undergoing a similar deterioration as the Picts. He doesn't lose his physical uh, aspect in this process, but his humanity and character that or originally put him above the Picts. And in this way, the tragedy of Bran's existence, the failing of his ambitions, and consequence or consequent loss of humanity are mirroring the fate and the history of the pigs. Thank you.